Harlow, 123123. Good evening. This is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, VK3 EKH, the official station of the Astronomical Society Victoria with the regular Friday night broadcast coming to you from the studios of VK3 CSJ in Narriwarren South on this 13th of uh, October Friday. Let's hope that's all good luck for everybody. <laughs> um, we're broadcasting on prime frequency of 3541 kilohertz in the 80 meter amateur radio band lower sideband and uh, also transmitting via the Melbourne television repeater VK3 RTV digital channel 1 good evening to viewers there and also via the uh, YouTube link uh, so if you type in VK3 CSJ in the YouTube search engine and look for the live symbol uh, that'll be uh, the YouTube stream and hopefully the uh, the stream will hang in there for the duration of the uh, the evening and, uh, and hopefully everything else will work out uh, tonight uh, without too, too many other issues. It should be a, a quick session tonight. Um, <laughs> I think I say that every um, every Friday, but uh, uh, I've just uh, quickly uh, put together a few articles that I could see. Uh, been having a, a few technical issues here, nothing unusual for the CSJ Shack. Anyway, we also have an email address, vk3ekh at 
uh, gmail.com. That's vk3ekh at gmail.com. And um, we're looking at the inbox uh, as we speak and uh, also the Discord chat window. And I can see that there's already a swag of folks there. <laughs> g'day, Rumus. And g'day, Steve, Mr. SPX. Um, welcome to tonight's session. Um, all right. Um, something else I was going to say. I can't remember now. It doesn't matter. All right. The Astronomical Society of Victoria, founded 1922, comprises well over 1,600 members scattered about Victoria and the states of Australia, including overseas membership. Membership of the Society is open to all persons with an interest in astronomy. The Society's objectives are to encourage the study and practice of astronomy, to disseminate the knowledge of the science and to provide greater facilities for the study among its members. Monthly meetings are usually held on the second Wednesday of each month, except in January, with the latter being held on a Saturday night. Meetings start at 8pm at the Mollier Hall, Burwood Avenue, Melbourne, near the Melbourne Observatory, which is located not too far from the Shrine of Remembrance. Parking is available in Burwood Avenue, Dallasbrooks Drive and the surrounding streets. Admission is free and visitors are most welcome. Privileges of membership include the right to borrow books, periodicals and other publications from the Society's extensive library located at the Melbourne Observatory. Uh, receipt of the ASV magazine crux containing news articles, observing notes and the like and the free provision of the astronomical yearbook. Access is available to telescopes on members nights held regularly at the Melbourne Observatory and after the monthly meetings with a permitting. These instruments include the Society's 300mm equatorial reflector and a 300mm portable reflector. There's also a 200mm refractor which is managed by the Royal Botanic Gardens and a photoheliograph are also housed at the observatory and are accessible to members too. The Society also has a number of 200mm reflectors available for short period loan, uh, the ASV's uh, loan scheme, so members can try telescopes if they wish to uh, later purchase, not the, that, the loan telescope, but if they wish to try before they buy type thing. Members are also encouraged to make use of the Society's country property located near Heathcote. Very pleasant good evening to anybody that's up at Heathcote uh, tonight. It might just happen to have the, uh, the television going in the corner. Uh, some 90 minutes drive north of Melbourne. <laughs> there are a range of instruments available for members to use. The larger two with appropriate training, uh, which range from 300mm to 1000mm in aperture. Also located on site is an 8.5 metre fully steerable radio telescope which members can access with involvement with the radio astronomy section. Members are encouraged to make and use telescopes. Advice and help on both matters are provided willingly to newcomers desiring to do the same. Instrument making is only one of the number of common interest activities catered for within the society. There's about 20, 21 sections now. Other areas of interest that members can participate in include deep sky observing, astrophotography, lunar and planetary observing, auroral, meteor, comet, radio astronomy, computing, cosmology and astrophysics, historical studies and research, and astronomy in general. Contact details for various section directors are provided in the yearbook. Further information may be obtained by visiting the ASV website. Uh, at www.asv.org.au that's www.asv.org.au uh, also notifications of events are given in the crux extra bulletins which is an email sent out every other week to members to keep people abreast of what's coming up into the near future um, also uh, ASV will conform to all government health directives ASV events may be required to be cancelled moved or postponed and if you wish to write to the ASV by mail, the Secretary, write to the Secretary, Astronomical Society of Victoria, GPO Box 1059, Melbourne, Victoria 3001. That's the Secretary, Astronomical Society of Victoria, GPO Box 1059, 1 minute to 11, that's how you remember that, <laughs> Melbourne, Victoria 3001 and all will be revealed. But like I say, the ASC website, which is still um, going a little bit under construction at the moment, there's still many things there that uh, haven't been completed yet from the transition from the old to the new, uh, but uh, still uh, all the basic information that you need to uh, 
uh, to claim about the uh, society and how to join um, and become a mem member and all that is is in fact there. You're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel with VK3 Charlie Sierra Juliet on the microphone. A very pleasant good evening to everybody there. G'day to Bill, VK3 KHT, who's no doubt watching the TV. Fine signals on ATV, yep. And uh, Martin, VK7JAH down there in Launceston. Cloudy down here, he says, but uh, 80 is good and YT, YT is working. Excellent stuff. Yes. <laughs> Alrighty then. Uh, where do we go to from now? Um, like I say, it's going to be a short session tonight. Where's my mouse? There it is. Uh, the first article I've got, to, I've pulled it down off the internet tonight. We've got a, a short uh, uh, solar report from Space Weather Woman. Uh, it's only five minutes. She's actually restricted herself to five minute uh, news session tonight. Uh, but we do have Tamitha there, uh, which I'll throw in just uh, just after I go through all these other notes. Um, so uh, uh, it's good to see that there's a report. That's only a few hours old, so it's uh, covering this weekend nicely. Um, all right, uh, back up here and go to here. All right, yeah, a little bit of an update on the satellite congestion in orbit around earth they are really looking into uh, uh, to the uh, the problems that we face with the congestion just uh, I'm stepping on my I've got, my, I've got the headphones on and I'm stepping on my lead here I think I'll invest into some wireless headphones hang on a sec alright just a, a few minor changes in the shack as we speak live on air as we go <laughs> um, all right um, this is courtesy of astronomy.com a satellite traffic jam calls for urgent changes more than a million satellites are launched with no signs of slowing down and they've got a little graphic here too so I'll, I'll just throw that graphic up on the screen uh, there it is there there and I think there's something else I can now do too with this editing thing. Uh, let me see if I can do it. Do it. Oh yes. Oh, that thing's in the way. Okay. <laughs> um, let me see if I can move that out. I, I'm just trying with an extra video uh, signal into the image here so that you can still see me rather than just the, the slide. But I've got my uh, I've got a little rotating ASV thing happening too, and I might be able to. I uh, just reposition that if uh, if I go on to this just bear with us for a second position we're working in vmix here that'll do nicely if it's sort of uh, okay I guess actually maybe I can drop that down to about there just above the ID yeah that may work okay I'll see how that goes all right so you can still sort of see me there in the insert I haven't I've been wanting to do that for ages to have a little video insert of me there while I'm, I've got something else happening on the screen Let's, let's see how that works. <laughs> oh dear. Uh, okay, so uh, published October 12, 2023. Um, as SpaceX, Amazon and others uh, try for supremacy in the race to establish constellations of communication satellites, the superhighway used by low Earth orbit LEO satellites is becoming dangerously cluttered to advert the equivalent of a multi-car pileup we need better traffic laws says authors of the paper published in science today next month's uh, quadrennial meeting in dubai of the world radio communications conference is the time for action they urge the first author andrew fall a researcher at the University of British Columbia's Outer Space Institute writes that by treating orbital space as an unlimited resource, we risk the very sustainability of the LEO space itself. Fall used the database of the United Nations International Telecommunications Union, ITU, where licenses for orbital spots 
and radio frequencies are filed to determine that more than 1 million LEO satellites, including 90 constellations exceeding 1,000 satellites, are already on the books with more to come. He and his catalogues, catalogues, <laughs> colleagues, he and his colleagues found that speculative f findings or filings are one of the central culprits that are putting the integrity of radio frequencies and space itself uh, at risk. Another is a uh, flag of convenience licensing, uh, like ship own, uh, ship owners flagging ships offshore to obtain low fees and lack scrutiny. Many satellite operators file in countries uh, with minimal space programs and oversight. To launch more than 3,000 Starlink satellites, for example, SpaceX registered licenses through multiple nations. The ITU filing, filings are the warning for rights and also part of the solution. There is urgent need for the ITU and its member states to adopt meaningful controls, he says. In an email to Astronomy this week, four suggested solutions such as financial disincentives for overlooking, sorry, overbooking, shortened launch windows for so-called paper satellites, uh, which are fictional craft unlike uh, fictional craft unlikely to ever launch, increased transparency of license ownership, and stricter adherence to orbits that are assigned. A critical mass of satellites. The competition between satellite operators shows no sign of abating. Last week, Amazon joined the fray with its first two prototype satellites for its Culpa project, promising to, to rival Starlink for decades and uh, to, by decades end. More hardware in space means an increase in likelihood of collisions, which could result in a runaway scenario referred to as the uh, Kessler syndrome, K-E-S-S-L-E-R, Kessler syndrome, and dramatized in the movie Gravity, Sandra Bullock. It is named after NASA's scientist Donald Kressler, who suggested in 1978 that satellite uh, proliferation would eventually result in collisions that would produce orbit orbiting fragments, each of which would increase the probability of future collisions leading to the growth of belt or of debris around Earth. Kessler, Kessler predicted that as a result, orbital space would become increasingly hazardous and some parts of LEO space could become unusable. The situation today has not reached a critical mass, but there are warning signs. In 2009, a satellite owned by the US tech firm Iridium slammed into a dead Russian satellite, sending thousands of fragments spinning in all directions. According to the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs, uh, there are now over 8,000 satellites orbiting Earth, and nearly half of those are dead or inactive. The Race to expand internet communications includes nations as well as corporations from China and Tonga. These efforts include arrays of CubeSats, small low-cost satellites that have lowered the, the barrier to entry. Many operators apply for far more orbital spots and radio frequencies than truly needed. Two years ago, an American interpreter uh, in in trop in oh, that word, Greg Weil eSpace filed for more than three hundred thousand satellites. Good grief! Through one of its directors, subsequently admitted that they were only planned a few thousand. Such proliferation has overwhelmed the ITU, giving applicants more competitive edge, but potentially turning space into a winner takes all racetrack. So the FCC steps up. While the ITU has no formal enforcement mechanism to ensure compliance among its 193 member nations and over 900 member companies, there is at least one space cop with teeth, the US Federal Communications Commission. Under an FCC rule adopted just over a year ago, 
LEO satellites must be removed by the operator within five years of mission's end. Earlier this month, US TV firm DISH won the dubious distinction of being the first satellite operator fined under the rule. The $150,000 penalty for failing to move one of its satellites higher into safe orbit after revealing it no longer had enough fuel to reach a graveyard orbit was relatively minimal, but the impact was measurable. Dish's market cap immediately fell some $100 million. It could also create a demand for space debris removal services. Already, several companies have formed for the express purpose of cleaning up space junk, and in the end, the company's bottom line and eagerness to avoid hefty fines may be the surest way to encourage space practices in space. Meanwhile, for astronomers, the prolification proliferation of constellation satellites arrays has created a visual and electromagnetic nightmare. Early this year, the National Science Foundation announced it had reached an agreement with SpaceX to mitigate the impact of the company's next generation Starlink satellites on astronomy. While the FCC granted SpaceX a license to operate one-fourth of its proposed 30,000 satellite array, the company agreed to dim its satellites below 7th magnitude, invisible to the naked eye, reduce the, their effect on sensitive astronomical instruments, and not transmit when passing over major radio observatories. With billions of dollars already invested in ground-based telescopes and billions more being invested to expand telecommunications worldwide, the contest over low Earth orbit space promises to, be, to become a growing dilemma. And of course the image that's been on the screen there uh, is a bit of a time elapse, but it's satellite trails near Earth taken from the data collected for six hours. So <laughs> while the guy has been t photographing that galaxy you can see in the image there over during a six hour period, that this is the, uh, the amount of space pollution that's interfered with that uh, one image. So it's uh, not a good thing at all. Absolutely not a good thing at all. <laughs> Anyway, all right. Um, multiple things I've got to do here all at once. You're tuned to VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria, with the regular Friday night broadcast. Um, okay. Good evening to Mr. VCL and uh, and Steve. There, that sent emails. Uh, just a quick look at the email there. <laughs> okay. <coughs> and who else? There's no more on the Discord there that I can see. Okay, fair enough. Um, next article. Mysterious radiation bursts could be becoming... Could be... Be... Coming... Two separate words there. <laughs> Not becoming. Mysterious radiation bursts could be coming from star quakes on neutron stars and there's an illustration with this article too which I'll throw up on the screen since they've provided one as well there it is and I'll bring up my other insert again here I am um, okay so this is published 23 hours ago plus or minus an hour if fast radio bursts that bombarded Earth are linked to star quakes, they could help scientists better understand earthquakes on our planet. And the illustration here is uh, an illustration of a neutron star undergoing a star quake, which is a violent event that could cause mysterious fast radio bursts, they say. 
Mysterious and rapid blasts of radiation that sweep over Earth could be a result of star quakes on dead stars or neutron stars. This connection could help scientists better understand earthquakes here on our planet. First discovered in 2007, fast radio bursts, FRBs, are invisible to human eyes but can be spotted by radio telescopes. They approach Earth from extragalactic sources, travel across billions of light years, and are so powerful they can outshine the entire galaxy from which they emerge. Yet, despite this incredible power, and the fact that as many as 10,000 FRBs could occur in the sky over Earth every day, the source of FRBs remains unknown, particularly because they are they often last just a thousandth of a second. FRBs are divided into two broad categories. Some FRBs repeat and others do not. The latter of which account for the vast majority of these radio wave outbursts. A clue in the mysterious FRB origin story involves the fact that the energy distribution of those repeating FRBs is similar to, that, to what we see with earthquakes. New research conducted by the University of Tokyo strengthened these similarities, suggesting that FRBs may be caused by starquakes on the surface of neutron stars. So what is shaking on neutron stars, you might ask? Neutron stars certainly match the extreme nature of FRBs. They are born when massive stars exhaust their fuel supply used for the intrinsic nuclear fusion processes and thereby fling away their outer layers in end-of-life supernova explosions. This leaves behind a stellar core with a mass between one and two times that of the Sun, which collapses to a width of about 12 miles or 20 kilometers. This rapid collapse has three major effects. First, it creates matter so dense that a single sugar cube of it would weigh around 1 billion tons if it could be brought to Earth. Second, it increases the spin of a neutron star akin to an ice skater drawing in their arms while spinning to speed up. That allows some of these stellar remnants to rotate as fast as 700 times per second. And finally, the collapsed, the, 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 the collapse squashes together magnetic field lines of the progenitor star, amplifying its strength and creating some of the most powerful magnetic fields in the known universe. Neutron stars, young neutron stars, with exceptionally strong magnetic fields are called magnetars and have previously been connected with the emission of FRBs. Starquakes are theorized to happen when the surface of a neutron star experiences a sudden shift, similar to an earthquake here on Earth. One potential cause has been suggested to be stress formed through the twisting of those exceptionally strong magnetic fields. It was th theoretically considered that the surface of a magnetar could be experiencing a starquake, an energy release similar to earthquakes on Earth. Team member of Department of Astronomy and Graduate School of Science researcher uh, Tomonori Totteni said in a statement, Recent observational advances have led to the detection of thousands more FRBs, so we took the opportunity to compare the now large statistical data sets available for FRBs with data from earthquakes and solar flares to explore possible similarities. The team looked at the timing and emission energies of around 7,000 repeating FRB bursts, applying the same method employed to examine the time-energy correlation of both earthquakes and solar flares. This showed a remarkable correlation between FRBs and earthquakes, but not FRBs and solar flares. The team discovered 
there were four major similarities between FRBs and earthquakes according to Totani. Firstly, the probability of an aftershock occurring for a single FRB and earthquake appears to be between 10 to 50 percent. Secondly, the rate of which the aftershocks happen seem to decrease with time, decrease with time, as a power of time. Next, the researcher added, the aftershock rate is always constant even if the average rate of FRB earthquake activity changes significantly. Finally, the team found no correlation between energies of the main shock of both events and that event's aftershock. This all indicated to the team that neutron stars have a solid crust and that when star quakes occur across them, they release huge amounts of energy, which we see as FRBs. To fully confirm this, the team intends to continue analysing new FRB data as it comes in. By studying star quakes on distant ultra-dense stars, which are completely different environments from Earth, we may gain new insights into earthquakes, said Totani. The interior of a neutron star is the densest place in the universe, comparable to that of the interior of an atomic nucleus. Starquakes in neutron stars have opened up the possibility of gaining new insights into very high density matter and the fundamental laws of nuclear physics. The team's research was published this month in the journal Monthly Notices of the Royal Astronomical Society. There it is. So, you're tuned to VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria. Alrighty, time is 28 past the hour. This is the next article, courtesy of Science Alert, sciencealert.com, talking about our own sun, this one, published 13th of October. Uh, okay, just checking it out briefly there. There is a little picture here of a, something that goes with the article. So I'll bring that up to bring my insert back in. There I am on the USB camera. Still, my, my YouTube is still hanging in there. Good to see. Where am I? Article. Here we are. All right. NASA. N-A-S-A. Uh, the title of this article goes something like this. We'd have 30 minutes warning before a killer solar storm hits Earth, is the article. We've touched on the hazards of solar storms plenty of times in the past. We've also recently started reporting even more stories involving some sort of AI, especially in the last few months since it has come back to the forefront of many discussions around the technologies artificial intelligence in other words. So it should come as no surprise that a team of NASA at NASA has been busily applying AI models to solar storm data to develop an early warning system that they think could give the planet about 30 minutes notice before a potentially devastating solar storm hits a particular area. That lead time is thanks to the fact that light, i.e. The, what radio signals are made out of, can travel faster than the solar material ejected out of the sun in the event of these solar storms. In some events, such as one that impacted Quebec around 35 years ago, uh, they can shut off, which, they can, which can shut off power for hours. More extreme events, such as the well-known Carrington event that happened more than 150 years ago, can cause massive destruction and of electrical and communication infrastructure if they were to happen today. Scientists have long been aware of the problem and haven't sat idly by. 
at this point in our species exploration of the solar system, plenty of satellites are looking at the Sun that can be used to identify these solar outbursts. Some of those satellites include ACE, ACE WIND, IMP-8 and GEOTAIL which supplied data to the NASA team. But as any AI researcher can tell you, in order to develop a predictive model, you have to tell it what it is meant to predict. Knowing, simple, knowing simply that a solar storm is on its way is only one part of the battle. You also have to know what kind of impact it will have on Earth when it hits here. So the researchers also collected data from surface-based stations that were also affected by some storms that satellites detected. The scientists then set about training a deep learning model which has recently become almost a household word. In this case they named it DAGA and it has some pretty impressive specifications compared to existing predictive algorithms that have attempted to do the same thing. Most notable is its increase in speed. The researchers led by, by Vishal Apendran from the Inter-University Centre of Astronomy and Astrophysics in India claim that the algorithm can predict the severity and direction of a solar system event in under a second and that it is capable of making a prediction every minute. Previous attempts by earlier algorithms would take orders of magnitude longer, almost to the point where they would, they, they would give hardly any warning time before a storm would hit Earth. Part of that struggle with timeless, timeless, timelessness, timeliness, yes, part of the struggle with timeliness <laughs> was because it was computationally change, changeling, oh my goodness, to calculate where a storm might hit anywhere on the globe. That's a sentence. That is another step forward for Dagger, which can perform its quickly predicting or prediction logic for the entire Earth's surface area. Making such predictions likely is extremely important at any point in time when a solar storm might hit the Earth, half the globe, will be protected by the planet's entire bulk, in a state of what we commonly refer to as night. <laughs> this combined speed of prediction, with the ability to apply those predictions to the entire globe, makes DAGA a considerable step forward in predicting any accurately responding and accurately responding to potential hazards from solar storms and it is launching on an open source platform just in time to collect plenty of data as the sun ramps up to the peak of its 11 year cycle in 2025. That gives utility and communication companies a few years to integrate, inter, integrate DAGA into the threat assessment systems before the most severe weather comes. While there might not be any wailing sirens similar to the tornado warning sirens uh, that we have here in the Midwest of the US, at least the right people will be made aware of the danger faster than they would have been before. There it goes. That was a little sentence that I just tripped over. Part of the struggle with timelessness, timeliness, never seen that combination, Part of this part of that struggle with timeliness was because of because it was computationally cha challenging to calculate. Try saying that several times quickly. <laughs> Timeless, timeliness, timeliness. Mm, all right, enough of that. You're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3EKH, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria, with the regular ASV Radio broadcast on the 13th of October. Next article. I've 
tried to pick ones that I can speak easily. <laughs> um, okay, come on, next article. This is also, oh yeah, okay, this is a bit of an update on the satellite return mission. Um, Osiris. I wasn't pronouncing that correctly either last time I read this article out. Osiris. I've been told it's called o Osiris. <sighs> Some of you might be might remember that just about, probably about two weeks ago now, uh, the probe that uh, deliberately landed briefly on a on an asteroid collected some samples and then came back to earth and it landed right on target in the states there and uh, anyway they've decided to open it up of course and analyze the data so okay there's a picture here of the internals of this uh, of this ship probe so let me just bring what they've got here up on the screen no, 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 no. That's, we've already had that one. There it is. There's the interesting shot. And I'll bring me back in the shot there. Alright, so this is courtesy again of ScienceAlert.com. First look at pristine asteroid dust reveals abundance of water and carbon. In fact, there was a news article on the Channel 7, 6 o'clock news on this, I think, Thursday night. They covered this. Uh, 12th of October. And the image you're seeing on the screen there is a view of the outside of the OSIRIS-REx sample collector with sample inside. So you can actually see the sample that was collected a sample collected from the four and a half billion year old asteroid Bennu contains abundant water and carbon. NASA revealed on Wednesday, offering more evidence for the theory that life on Earth was seeded from outer space. The discovery follows a seven year round trip to the distant rock as part of the OSIRIS REx mission which dropped off its precious payload in the Utah desert last month for painstaking scientific analysis. This is the, the biggest carbon-rich asteroid sample ever returned to Earth, NASA Administrator Bill Nielsen said at a press event at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, where the first images of black dust and pebbles were revealed. Carbon accounted for almost 5% of the sample's total weight and was present, present in both organic and mineral form while the water was locked inside the crystal structure of clay minerals, he said. Scientists believe the reason Earth has oceans, lakes and rivers is because it was hit with water carrying asteroids four to four and a half billion years ago, making it a habitable planet. All life on Earth, meanwhile, is based on carbon, which forms, beyond, which forms bonds with other elements to produce proteins and enzymes, as well as the building blocks of genetic code DNA and RNA. The findings were made through a preliminary analysis involving scanning electron microscope, X-ray, computed, computed uh, tomography, and more. This stuff is an astrobiologist's dream, said scientist Daniel Galvin, adding there was much more work to be done and the sample would be shared with labs around the world for further study. OSIRIS-REx wasn't the first probe to rendezvous with an asteroid and bring back samples for study. Japan succeeded in the feat twice, returning celestial dust in 2010 and 2020. But the amount collected, an estimated 250 grams, half a pound, dwarfs that returned by the Japanese missions with Hayabusa 2, managing only 5.4 grams. Named after an ancient Egyptian deity, Benu, B E N N U, is a primordial artifact preserved in the vacuum of space, according to NASA, 
making it an attractive target for study. Its orbit, which interacts with that of our planet, also made the journey easier than going to the asteroid belt which lies between Mars and Jupiter. In addition to scientific insights, better understanding of Bennu's composition could prove useful if humanity ever needs to steer it away. While there is no risk of it hitting Earth through the mid-2100s, the chance rises the chance rise to around 1 to 1750 between then and the year 2300, NASA says. <laughs> NASA gathered, NASA, sorry, data gathered by the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft revealed the particles making up Bennu's exterior were so loosely packed that if a person were to step on to the surface, they might sink in, much like a pit of plastic balls in a children's play area. Researchers have so far focused their efforts not on the main sample itself, but on bonus particles that lay on top of the sample collected me co collecting mechanism. An inspection of the remainder of the sample will follow later. Back in October 2020, when OSIRIS-REx probe shot nitrogen gas at Bennu to collect material, a flap meant to seal the sample got wedged open, allowing some of the material to flow out into another compartment. The very best problem to have is, is that there is so much material it's taking longer than we expected to collect it, said Deputy OSIRIS-REx curation, curation lead Christopher Sneed in a statement. NASA says it will persevere at least 70% of the sample. Sorry, NASA says it will preserve at least 70% of the sample at Houston for future study. A practice first started in the Apollo era with moon rocks. The samples are then available for new questions, new technologies, and new instr instrumentation far into the future," said Aline Sansbury, division chief of the. Astro Materials Research at Johnston Space Centre. Additional pieces will be sent for public display at the Smithsonian Institution Space Centre at Houston and the University of Arizona. Hmm. Well, I'm glad that was uh, of some success for them. I'm glad the, the probe landed uh, and didn't break up and spill half its contents and mixed it with Earth's uh, soil and all that sort of thing, which could have easily have happened. So, um, yeah, I'm glad that was a success. And um, the actual probe itself, uh, Osiris Rex, is on going on to another probe. It hasn't just ended; it's uh, heading out to uh, some other probe to catch uh, a, a sample, another sample, it seems. So some very good forethought there with the planning on that particular exercise. VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, ASV Radio. Um, next article. Uh, next article is this one. <laughs> All right. What is the cosmic web made of, you might ask yourself. And there's a image here which I shall bring up as well. It's all part of the article. Bingo. I can hear a hum in my headphones. That's probably what's distracting me a little bit. Uh, what is Cosmic Web made of? The Cosmic Web is part of the universe's large-scale universe. It is composed of dark matter, gas, and galaxies. Published October 9. Large observations... Actually, it's a question um, that somebody's asked. What is the cosmic web composed of? Large observation programs that map the universe reveal that the distribution of galaxies is far from random. Such a deviation from randomness is called the universe's large-scale structure, and the cosmic web is a building block of this structure. In order of abundance, the cosmic web is composed of dark matter, gas, and galaxies. Dark matter, which makes up about five-sixths of the mass, does not 
interact with light but dominates the gravitational pull of the cosmic web. Dark matter provides the scaffolding for the formation of galaxies and galaxy clusters. The rest, one-sixth of the cosmic web, consists of normal matter, baryons, such as protons and neutrons and electrons. It exists either in the form of intergalactic gas or as the stars and interstellar medium, gas and dust, in galaxies. The gas in the cosmic web can not sorry can sorry, start that again. The gas in the cosmic web can be hot or cold, depending on its location. Gas within galaxy clusters is typically very hot, in the range of tens of millions of degrees. This material is known as intracluster gas or intracluster medium ICM. The ICM emits X-rays that can be observed and, and provides a way to study the distribution of mass within clusters and the history of cluster formation. The ICM, the intracluster medium, also plays an important role in the evolution of galaxies within the cosmic web, as it can strip gas out of galaxies and prevent the formation of new stars. Conversely, the gas in the filaments of the cosmic web, which you can see, the, the picture on, on the screen right now is an illustration. Um, it, it's a frame, <coughs> a frame from the illustrious, illustrious, illustrious. That's it. Illustrious simulation shows a massive galaxy cluster at the center. Uh, red, orange and white colours show hot gas, while blue and purple filaments depict a cosmic framework of dark matter. Hmm. So, where was I? <laughs> um, conversely, the gas in the filaments of cosmic web connects galaxy clusters and superclusters, and it is typically colder, ranging from thousands of tens of thousands of degrees. This gas is known as warm, hot, intergalactic medium, or WIM. <laughs> the WIM is difficult to observe directly because it is not as hot or as dense as the gas in the ICM and the light it emits does not penetrate very far into the universe before being absorbed. Nevertheless, the WIM, warm, hot, intergalactic medium, is believed to be a significant reservoir of baryonic matter in the universe. It may also play an important role in the growth of galaxies by providing a source of fuel for the formation, formation of new stars. Galaxies are grouped in clusters and superclusters and embedded within the cosmic web. Throughout their lifetime, galaxies continuously interact with the gas in the cosmic web. Gas from the web falls into galaxies to make stars, and gas within galaxies is ejected into the cosmic web by winds from supernovae and active supernova, supermassive black holes. These interactions may hold the key to understanding the evolution of galaxies. Amazing Grace. One more article before we go across to Tamitha's report. You're tuned to ASV Radio VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria with a regular Friday night broadcast. Right. And now we have a picture of the moon. I think it's there. Yes, there it is. <laughs> uh, dearie me. How long is this article? Oh, it's only a short article. Yeah, about five minutes. Published October 10, 2023. The moon has less water than we thought. By calculating the age of lunar shadow regions, researchers are drawing a bead on, how, on, on our satellite's water ice. When researchers first noted ev ev <laughs> when researchers first no noted evidence of water on the moon, they also found permanently shadowed regions, areas that do not see the sun and therefore are frigid, providing the perfect place to foster water ice. Experts suspect the areas have held trapped volatiles for up to billions of years. Observations from instruments on orbiters and probes found that the moon's north and south poles contain over 1.3 million trillion sorry, pounds 
of water ice, 600 billion kilograms. But a new study published in Science Advances found that there might be less water in these shadowed areas than previously believed. While most of the shaded regions on the moon are around 3.4 billion years old, they contain deposits of water ice that are significantly younger. Such shaded areas on the moon interest researchers because water locked up as ice could be used to create fuel and air as well as sustain humans on the lunar surface in the future. NASA and other government agencies plan on sending rovers and humans to the moon to further look into the ice in the shaded regions, according to the press release. The moon's rotational axis is nearly perpendicular to the direction of incoming sunlight, creating regions like the bottoms of craters on the lunar south pole that have not seen light for billions of years. These shaded areas on the moon started to form around 4.1 billion years ago when the satellite's spin axis shifted, creating a high angle tilt. When this tilt began to decrease due to the evolution of the moon's motion, the shaded regions formed at the poles. Researchers from the Southwest Research Institute of Planetary Science Institute used a simulation tool dubbed AstroGeo 22 to calculate the moon's actual tilt over time, axial tilt over time. These, sorry, those results, <laughs> combined with the surface height measurement data collected from NASA's Lunar Orbit Altimeter Laser, Altimeter, Laser, or LOA, LOLA, 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 L-O-L-A data allowed scientists to estimate how the moon's shadowed regions evolved and created a map of the areas. By calculating how old the shaded regions are, researchers can determine how much water is, is sequestered in there. In 2009, scientists collected data on volatiles found near in the crater Cobias near the moon's south pole. Uh, after deliberately smashing the Lunar Crater Observation and Sensor Satellite LACROSSE L C R O S S in onto the surface into the surface. After the crash, the resulting plume revealed that the soil at the crater's bottom consisted of 5.6% water ice. The new study sheds light as to when this crater may have become a shaded region. Our work suggests that Cebus Cabeus C-A-B-E-U-S, -E C-A-B-E-U-S, Cabeus, yeah? Crater became a PSR less than a billion years ago. A PSR. What was a PSR? Anyway, uh, yep, less than a billion years ago, uh, said Norbert, oh, I won't try his surname, it's some funny word. Anyway, Norbert is his first name, <laughs> who's the lead author of the study. The various volatiles detected in the plume created by Lacrosse indicated that ice trapping continued to into relatively recent times, Norbert said, who is a senior scientist at the Planetary Science Institute, continued. The age of PSRs... PSRs, where was that? Just having a quick look at these... The text here for what that is. I can't see the acronym for that. Anyway, um, so yes, yeah, so um, the various volatiles detected in the plume created by Lacrosse indicated that the ice trapping continued to into relatively recent times. Um, the age of the PSRs largely determines the amount of water ice that could be trapped in the lunar polar regions. Having said that, science, sorry, since the 1960s, Planetary scientists have sub sub suspected that if water exists on the moon, it might be hidden as ice in the permanently shadowed regions that never see the light of day. But when astronauts first took one giant leap into the onto the moon during the Apollo missions, they found no evidence of water. For a long time, researchers wondered if the lunar surface was dry was a dry abyss. It would be decades before researchers considered the possibility of water on the surface again. 
During the 1990s, NASA's Clementine mission and the Lunar Prospector mission hinted at evidence of frozen water in the permanently shadowed regions on the Moon. Confirming confirmation was lacking, uh, however, because images taken by the Lunar Prospector were too blurry. Finally, evidence of a watery past on the Moon arrived as specks of volcanic glass. A study published in 2008 in Nature revisited the lunar the first lunar samples returned by the Apollo missions and, with refined analysis, uh, unveiled hydrogen trapped in the glass. This led the team to suspect that water could have come from the Moon's ancient volcanoes. That same year, India launched its first deep space mission, Chandran-1, uh, which held NASA's Moon's Mineralogy Mapper, Mineralogy Mapper, Together, the spacecraft and instrument confirmed the presence of water ice on the Moon, and the paper was more recently published uh, in 2018. It, then, in 2020, NASA's SOFA, SOFIA mission confirmed water even on sunlit areas on the Moon. NASA's Artemis missions aim to transport humans uh, for long-term assignments on the Moon uh, because supplies are limited. Uh, living on the lunar surface will require ingenuity and smart use of resources found on the moon's surface, including water ice. And aside from supporting life and industrial use of water, ice and other com compounds found on the moon's shadowy regions will give scientists a look at the moon's early days and early solar system. You're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel. And now we shall, uh, just to get rid of this insert here, <coughs> and I'll queue up Tamitha's five-minute report. Uh, that's not it. Where are you, Tamitha? There you are. Okay, so just five and a half minutes. Uh, still went for an hour. Anyway, now I'm going to have to wind the level down, because I still haven't quite worked out why I... The level coming off the computer here is so much higher than everything else. You're tuned to VK3 EKH ASV Radio. Stand by for Timothy. On sending us some fast solar wind and some big flare players leave while some new ones enter. Those stories and more in the news this week. Space weather this week continues to be a bit on the mild side. As we take a look at our Earth-facing disk, most of the activity has been from region 34, 51, and 52. However, these regions have been rotating to the sun's far side, so we're not going to be seeing much more in terms of radio blackouts due to them. However, we do have a coronal hole that is going to be rotating into the Earth strike zone here in the next 24 hours or so. It could give us some fast solar wind that could bump us up to storm levels and give us possibly some aurora at high latitudes, probably not too much down at mid latitudes. We're probably going to see unsettled to active conditions there, but I'll talk more about that in a minute. But this is enough to be able to give us a little bit of a, a nice show at high latitudes for a little while. On top of that, we have region 3460. This region is beginning to really show some level of growth and is beginning to fire off some big solar flares. So we could be seeing uh, R1 to R2 level radio blackouts pick out up or pick up from that one. Also, region 3462 is one to watch. We're going to be keeping close eye on that one because that one is also growing quite rapidly. Now we also have a couple other filaments on the disk, but though thus far those regions have been pretty quiet. Now switching to our heliospheric magnetic imager, you can see the regions here that we've been watching. 34, 51, and 52 have been pretty complex, but again, they're rotating to the sun's far side. On top of that region, 34, 60, you definitely see some magnetic complexity in that region, so we're t keeping our eyes on it. And if you go beyond 34, 62 and look at the east limb, you really see a lot of activity growing and some definite chances for big solar flares from these far-sided regions that will be rotating into Earth view over the next probably three to four days, so we'll be taking care of that. Now switching to our solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week. At high latitudes, we are anticipating that fast solar wind from that uh, coronal hole that's rotating in through the Earth's strike zone. At high latitudes, NOAA is expecting active conditions with up to about a 50% chance of a major storm. And this is easily going to continue throughout the 13th and start calming down.
on the 14th uh, when we get to about mostly calm, if not calm conditions. So Aurora photographers, if you're at high latitudes, you definitely could get a show over these couple days before things settle down as we get into next week. Now, as we switch to our mid-latitude aurora possibilities, we are still expecting active conditions from that fast solar wind, but we're only expecting about 15% chance of minor storm conditions, and this will last through about the 13th before things really begin to calm down. We are expecting uh, things will calm down quite quickly, so aurora photographers, if you're at mid-latitudes, well, you can get a skosh of a chance around the 12th but expect that things will be much more fleeting than they are at high latitudes. So only if you're dedicated should you chase. Now, switching into your solar flare and dayside radio blackout outlook over the coming week, we are sitting at about 164 solar flux right now. NOAA is anticipating that that's going to dip just a little bit uh, as region 34, 51, and 52 leave the Earth facing disk. But expect because those new regions are going to be rotating into Earth view over the next couple days, we will begin to see that solar flux rise again. This means we're going to remain in good conditions for amateur radio propagation on Earth's day side. How However, we are sitting at the moderate noise level. We will drop down to the minor noise level over uh, the 13th and 14th, but likely still continue in and around uh, the moderate noise level, especially as we move into the early next week. And again, that's because we do have some growth in some of these new regions. NOAA is giving us about a 35% chance of um, uh, M-class flares. That's at the R1 to R2 level radio blackout. And even about a 5% chance of an R3 level radio blackout over the next day or so. We'll dip down a little bit, but then that chance once again will rise. So amateur radio operators and emergency responders expect to have, you know, the moderate chance of uh, R1 to R2 level radio blackouts and, you know, a bit of noise on the bands, but overall conditions should be pretty good. Now, as we switch to our radiation storm and polar aviation outlook over the coming week, everything is in the green. We are sitting at the D1 normal range. Uh, this is for you aviators at flight level 360. This is also the S0 quiet range, which means uh, for everyone else that we don't have much of a risk at all for uh, big radiation storms. In fact, NOAA's only giving us about a 5% chance of uh, risk over the next three days, and I'm extending that through the five day. Really don't see any reason why we should be worried about having radiation storms. So if you are a frequent flyer, and this includes uh, high risk passengers or, or prenatal passengers or even air crew, you're all in the clear, and it looks like things are gonna be smooth sailing throughout the week. For more details on this week's space weather, please check out my channel or see me at spaceweatherwoman.com. Oh, right oh. Heaps of audio all of a sudden. One, two, one, two, one, two. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Uh, what with distorting on YouTube. Oop, back to uh, the camera. Uh, yeah, look, uh, <coughs> I hope that came across okay. It, it wasn't the audio wasn't right. I, I could hear heaps of hiss and, and crap on it, um, and uh, I just 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 don't know why uh, the level is so uh, obscure. Um, it's never been too much of an issue really, but I don't know. Lately, something's changed, so it's got got me. Um, anyway, I, I can see the still got too much level here uh, on the uh, YouTube side of it. One, two, why is that so loud there? <coughs> one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. I don't, if I knock that down any further, you're not going to hear me. Um, my levels are all over the place. It's just so, such a nuisance factor. Um, one, two, one, <coughs> one, two, 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 righto. Okay, it is six minutes coming up to past 11. <laughs> I'll, go, I'll go very quickly into what uh, spaceweather.com um, has to say for itself. Um, so, um, spaceweather.com. <coughs> Testing one, two, three. Hmm. Okay, the solar wind is currently at 359.5 kilometers a second at a density of 22.75 protons per cubic centimeter. The current disk of the sun, which looks like this, um, it's got uh, quite a number of sunspots there, but that's what the current look is. And uh, uh, as of the 13th of October, 
Um, the current sunspot number is 126. The radio sun, uh, measured at a wavelength of 10.7 centimetres, is 157 solar flux units. The coronal um, image, now I don't usually show this, but because I brought it across, I thought I'll bring it up. There it is. Um, so, um, uh, as of the 13th of October, there are no significant coronal holes on the Earth side of the Sun. So, um, there it is. And the KP index um, is currently 3.33, which is considered quiet. Uh, over the next 24 hour max, the KP is also still 3.33, considered quiet for those interested in the KP figure. And the current auroral oval over the South Pole is looking like that. So there's not much at the moment to um, to write home about, as I always say. <laughs> there's just a slight hint of a glow if you are down there, but otherwise there's not much in the, in the way to speak of as far as auroral activity is concerned. And of course there is a solar eclipse occurring um, over the United States um, this weekend, I think it is, tomorrow in fact I think. And there's a graphic that's just showing you the path of totality. That's a little GIF image that's running there. There it is, right across the states. They, they're just going to get tr so treated with this uh, eclipse going through the Gulf of Mexico and then coming up on um, the... Um, uh, that um, canal and then going right over uh, through with the Amazon in South America so it's going to be quite a spectacular eclipse for everybody concerned in that country the Americas magnificent um, all right let me go back to the camera uh, and I think I shall finish off by saying that just having a quick look here um, oh yeah, it's just everything's about the eclipse okay so as of the 13th of October there were 2,349 potentially hazardous asteroids all right okay well um, just checking my email uh, g'day Dove nice to see uh, um, uh, uh, an email from you there haven't heard seen anything from you for ages <laughs> so welcome uh, for uh, the email thank you very much Lee uh, Ian uh, VK3KIS has sent me an email and uh, 5 and 9 plus on 30 on 40 on 80 uh, and uh, in this yes the sorry that's Ian VK5KKKT and uh, and Wayne yes is noisy you reckon okay and Steve um, maybe if you do be down tonight oh okay I've probably got things turned down a little bit too just to prevent any hour of getting into things but I think I've got that sorted out although I can hear earth buzz in my headphones which is a real nuisance on that note I thank you for listening on this 13th of October and uh, um, we'll be back next week to do it all again in the meantime um, I'll um, pick up my logbook and a pen here and uh, have a quick listen on the band and see if there's any stations wishing to uh, check in for tonight. This is VK3 EKH listening on 3541. Okay, we've got a Got a nice uh, doubling all happening there. Uh, VK3GL, VK5KKT, VK3JR, VK3SBX, VK7JAH. Uh, is there anybody else uh, that I missed? VK3CJS, was it? Oops, hang on. Oh, sorry. Hang on. Pressed the wrong button. VK3CJS, was it?
Oh, Jack. Okay, yeah, you, your audio sounds a bit funny. Um, that's why I didn't pick it up straight away. It sounds, uh, I don't know why, but it just sounds a little funny. We'll give you a go <laughs> at the end of the list there. All right. Um, Graham, have a say. Welcome back to uh, Australia from your European holiday. VK3GL, Bunyip, VK3EKH. Yeah, good on you, Graham. VK3 GL, VK3 EKH. Yes, I can, I can tell you, your vocal cords are under stress. <laughs> um, it's always the way you you uh, come back from overseas, and uh, you, you <laughs> I don't know how many people I've known that have come from holidaying overseas, and they always come back with some bug, or uh, or at least um, the transition in climate to, from overseas to here always seems to. Uh, uh, to 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 bring some sort of hassle. So anyway, you'll get over it um, by this time next week. You should be right, <laughs> hopefully. Anyway, thanks, Craig. Good to hear you back. And yes, it was a, it was a bit of a pity that your um, your uh, two way wireless you had in the car uh, decided to uh, misbehave. Um, what a nuisance that was! Because we were all looking forward to uh, working you. Uh, while you were holidaying over there, and at least we did manage to, uh, you know, a few of us there managed to work here that day on 20 metres some, with some success uh, before things sort of failed. So, yeah, anyway, there it is. Thanks, Craig. Okay, across to Ian, VK5 Kilo Kilo Tango, two worlds, VK3 EKH. VK5 KKT, VK3 EKH returning. You know, I, when I first started uh, doing the broadcast here on Friday nights, um, well, I wasn't, uh, it, it's not as if I had the habit of doing it, but it <laughs> usually Friday nights were a, a fish and chip night. 
and uh, I always used to look forward to uh, fish and chips, which would always go down with a glass of wine. And um, um, I think that the first uh, number of Friday nights that uh, I, I would have to wander upstairs here to do the broadcast, um, I, I noted that... Uh, 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 that the effects of one glass of, uh, of white wine was too much. <laughs> so I, I figured it was probably a good idea not to, uh, not to do it. But I must admit I was a little bit more uh, lively uh, than I am. But you might be right. Uh, maybe it's... Uh, no, I won't do that. I'm in the process of uh, losing weight at the moment, so I'm, I'm avoiding anything like alcohol. And... Uh, anything that's got sugar in it so <laughs> I'm being good um, yeah anyway there it is I won't make any more excuses but if, look the main thing is if you guys have a giggle over the mispronunciations and the struggling that's fine by me don't take it seriously I'm not taking it seriously um, I'm just doing out doing this whole thing out of the goodness of my heart and uh, uh, and the fact that I'm interested in astronomy and um, a about to launch my own observatory in the backyard. In fact, it's arriving next week, uh, I can tell you. Uh, my three-metre scope dome uh, is arriving next uh, Wednesday morning uh, on the back of a truck with a big crane on it, and uh, it will sit on its pallet uh, until the team uh, come to uh, in install it, hopefully in the next week or two. But... Um, it's almost happening, almost happening. We're getting my telescope set up with, with a camera on it and taking pictures. <laughs> I hope it works. I, I really do. Um, I, I know how important it is to have a, a dark sky uh, for an observatory. But in suburbia, it's, uh, it's a trick because of the so much glare from, from city lights and haze in the sky. But you can get filters. There are filters that cut through all that and uh, really do uh, make the job of taking pictures a bit easier. We're going to explore all that. Enough of that. Thanks, Ian. We'll think about having a glass next Friday. <laughs> How's that sound? <laughs> I actually, I don't. Oh, yeah, I do. I've got some, um, uh, yeah, I've got some port. No, that would be too much. Um, all right. Um, Mr. Frank, VK3JR, VK3EKH. Yeah, good on you, Frank. VK3 JR, VK3 EKH, and uh, I shall turn the AR7 on and have that uh, ready for listens on 1865, I think it is, isn't it? 1865. Uh, I think that's the, you the frequency for Stu, VK3 SL's test transmissions. Um, all right, thanks, Frank. And yes, I will. Uh, the intention is to do it because um, <coughs> uh, I've... Um, as I've been saying, I've had an interest in, in uh, looking at the stars uh, using telescope, proper telescopes, real telescopes, for a long time. And um, it's now coming to a point where uh, I'm going to be able to do it. Um, but uh, I want to, yeah, you know, I've got three telescopes to experiment with, and um, um, I, I need to in, explore how to set them up and use them on the EQ6 uh, equatorial mount and um, get a feel for them um, before putting a camera on it and seeing how well the camera works. 
uh, I still might be too much level on YouTube there, I don't know. Anyway, um, alright, so there it is. But we shall at least give you guys updates as we go. Um, thanks, Frank. Uh, Steve, Mr. SPX, the man that's got the observatory and a telescope already set up. <laughs> I downloaded um, Smart Top Stop. Was it, what was it called again? Smart Top. Um, it's splash Top, that's it. <laughs> uh, splash Top. But of course, I because I haven't got anything set up yet, uh, I haven't been able to set it up. Uh, so I've, I've downloaded to explore it, but there's not much you can do uh, uh, without having a, a remote computer actually running and set up so that you can do the experiment. So I'm almost there on that one, Steve. VK3SPX, VK3EKH. Steve VK3 SPX VK3 EKH. Yeah, I, as far as the uh, um, splash topic, I, I don't know why I didn't think of that. <laughs> just, I've got the ex uh, c computer around here. I can always just experiment with it, and see how it uh, interfaces. So I'll uh, I'll do that. I didn't think of it. Um, it's like yeah, it, it's uh, I've got these telescopes and and they're all sitting on ice until. Uh, uh, until the observatory gets built, um, it's like everything starts from that day. <laughs> um, anyway, um, yeah, it's it's a it's a serious issue with uh, the a number of satellites going up and these companies that in, insist on putting up so much uh, in into the uh, into orbit, low Earth orbit particularly. And it's interesting that the FCC are the ones that uh, stipulated the rule about a five year. Uh, term on a lot of these satellites so um, but uh, not all of them though yeah it's going to become an issue it really is I'm sure it is uh, keeping a track on on all these uh, satellites and particularly the uh, the uh, the graveyard uh, orbit that must exist I, I, I don't know how many dead satellites have been parked in that graveyard orbit but there must be a few of them Anyway, um, no worries, Steve. Uh, we'll, uh, um, like I said, we'll keep you abreast of what's happening with uh, the rest of the uh, observatory when it finally gets uh, coming together. I'll, uh, I'll have some uh, footage uh, of this uh, dome being dropped off 
and um, hopefully I might be able to run it on the broadcast next Friday. Um, okay, across to Martin, VK7JAH, VK7JAH, VK3EKH. Yep, yeah, no worries, Martin, VK7, JAH, VK3, EKH returning. Yeah, you're coming through nice and clear too, a good uh, 10 or so over 9. And if you're still listening, Ian, uh, you're, you're a good 5 and 9 plus. Um, obviously not, not, not as strong as I seem to be getting, coming through, but uh, um, you're yeah, definitely a good 5 and 9 plus, coming, picking sometimes up to 10. And uh, yeah, same with you, Martin, a good, uh, good signal, but good readable. And uh, yeah, like I say, I, I <laughs> it's uh, not to be t- taken too seriously. Um, I guess if I was uh, trying to make the broadcast a, a, a serious thing, I suppose I would um, uh, look at doing the articles that I, I, I pick and choose and maybe do a, a recording offline. Uh, so I can get it right <laughs> and just play a whole heap of uh, audio files um, but it, it wouldn't have the spontane- spontaneity and uh, genu- genuine aspect to it anyway it doesn't matter um, alright thanks Martin good signal from you and uh, thanks for calling in and um, and yes I am glad the uh, YouTube sta- stayed up um, so yeah I don't know all right, Jack, up there in Shepparton. Let's see how we co- are copying you tonight. VK3 TJS, VK3 EKH. Uh, VK3 Not a problem. Yep, no worries, Jack. Yes, you're peaking 20 over uh, on the uh, the other radio, this radio that you're on now. So, uh, yeah, there was a little bit of, um, I, I'm not sure, uh, um, uh, a little bit of furriness, I guess you could say, uh, on the on that other radio. But uh, this one's got much, uh, much better audio quality and uh, punches through. So, um, not a problem at all. But, yeah, no, thanks, Jack, uh, for uh, calling in there at the end. And... Um, not a problem at all. Okay, is there any other stations wishing to check in? VK3 EKH. K3 
Okay, this is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria with a uh, regular Friday night broadcast here on the 13th of October. Wishing you all a very pleasant weekend. Stay warm and uh, we'll see you all next Friday. And uh, uh, in the meantime, yep, take care. Thank you very much for listening to tonight's session and... Uh, uh, we'll uh, we'll be back all next week. So this is VK3 EKH ASV Radio. Uh, more information about the society can be gleaned from the website at www.asv.org.au. Very pleasant. Good evening, everybody. VK3 EKH. Thanks for everybody who's uh, also up in Discord. Uh, Remus and um, and Bill VK3 KHT. Thanks, guys. Uh, and the folks up there on the um, email as well, and Dave, yep, excellent. VK3, EKH, clear. Alright, so thank you everybody, and for all those folks on YouTube, um, I hope the audio level's been okay on YouTube, I hope it hasn't been too loud. I must get my uh, audio levels sorted out, I don't know what's gone wrong here, but Things have gone skew with. So we shall say a very pleasant good evening. I shan't persist any longer. Um, I was actually... There is a video I'd like to play. It goes for about 29 minutes. But I've sent an email off to the folks or the person in who did this video just to see if I can get the permission side of it sorted out. I, th I don't think it would be an issue. But I thought I'd do the right thing and get to see if I can get a reply from this fellow, um, Tom Scott. I think his name is Tom Scott or Tom Smith. He's he's got a fairly decent YouTube channel, but he's uh, he's taken a, a video of um, uh, a thirty-minute uh, video of his trip out to uh, the very large telescope at Chile. Uh, thanks to. I think it was um, I think it was Bill. Bill, you sent that link to me, didn't you? <coughs> bk 3 kht Bill. I think you did. Could be wrong. Um, but anyway, I followed that through, and um, like I say, I've sent uh, an email to the sky to see if it's okay if I can play it. It's quite uh, safe. There's no <laughs> no weird music in it. There's no advertising until the very end there but I can cut it before then so it's pretty safe for, for showing and uh, it was quite interesting so uh, if I can get uh, a word back from him before next Friday I'll, I'll try and show that uh, next Friday giving me a bit of a rest <laughs> um, yeah anyway enough of that um, everybody good night take care it's uh, it's uh, over and out from me and over and out by from him <laughs> and uh, we'll see you all next week cheerio for now